when she walked through the door, I'm like, oh, snap. That's like really her, like in the flesh, like, oh my God, oh my God. Six times two weight boxing champion, activist and actress, Katie Reese. Currently starring in HBO series, True Detective, Night Country. Uh, first Native American co-lead in a HBO Max series. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. I didn't even, I didn't even realize that. I'm just kind of, you know, chopping wood and carrying water and people are telling me, I'm like, oh, really? Oh, I didn't notice that. Well, yeah, thank you. Keeping your feet on the ground then, doing the chopping of the wood. I am. I got to, man, especially right now. It's always been my go-to, but like it's uh, very, very prominent now as well. Actually, uh, it's not co-lead because apparently it's, uh, they've given you another title. Let me know what that is. The lead, the lead, lead, the other lead, the other lead, I guess. <laughs> well, to be fair, the narrative really is about you, isn't it? It is about Navarro and it's, you know, uh, Jody Forza, I told you Jody Forza, she um, is so adamant about making sure that she says that and she's, she's so supportive on saying, you know, Danvers, her character is really supporting the journey of, of my character, which is Navarro, which is a beautiful thing because, you know, I'm just like, you know, there's two characters, but once you really get to the end of this story, you can kind of see it's really around her story and her journey, meaning Navarro. <laughs> So uh, when you talk about Jodie, because obviously now you're friends, we're talking about uh, Ms. Jodie Foster, two-time uh, Oscar winner, uh, early work, I think she was in Taxi Driver, Bugsy Malone, uh, most people will probably know from Silence of the Lamb. But, um, the Accused, yeah, she has a rap sheet, like it's insane. Quality, quality, quality actress. Um, um, you play, uh, is it Evangeline Navarro? Uh, can you give me a brief synopsis of the series? So True Detective is an anthology series. and We're on the fourth season. Um, and I play Trooper, Alaskan State Trooper Evangeline Navarro. She is half Inupiaq and half Dominican, uh, ex-military, ex-marine. Um, and she and Liz Danvers, who's played by Jodie Foster, is a detective in the APF, which is a fictional um, part of Alaskan policing. And they live in a very rural, very northern part of Alaska where it goes dark for uh, about two months uh, until the sun starts to rise all the way again. And it's based around, um, if you go to Alaska, 75 to 80% of the population is Native, Alaska Native, Inuit, Inupiaq. So um, Issa Lopez, the writer-director, she composed this story about these scientists who do the research in the Arctic and all of a sudden they go missing. And Liz Danvers and the other police detectives um, have to find out what's going on. But Liz Danvers and Evangeline Navarro have history. And um, due to a case that had happened about six or seven years prior to that Evangeline Navarro just cannot let go, um, they have to work together to try to find what happened to these scientists and also see how it relates to the other murder of this Inupiaq activist woman. Liz Danvers and Evangeline Navarro have these individual crazy lives that are a mess. Um, they hate each other, absolutely loathe each other's presence, but they respect each other and they, they probably hate even more that they work really good together. And um, you get to kind of see their journey unfold. A little bit like uh, when promoters in boxing have to work together and they hate each other. <laughs> yes yep oh boy just like that all for the greater good all for the greater good maybe they probably despise each other's faces but they're gonna smile and nod and shake the babies and kiss the hands and make the business work <laughs> <laughs> too right um talking about uh the director uh, is it is a isla Isla Lopez, let me pronounce that correctly. Isla Lopez. Issa, Issa. Issa. Oh, I was right the first time. Issa uh, Lopez. Wasn't she, um, or didn't she rather, see you in uh, Catch the Fair one and then decide that's the one? That's the one I want. That's pretty much how it happened. I mean, this is literally my third acting job, and she, they were looking to fill the, the, the role of Navarro, and her cast and director saw Catch the Fair one and was like, look at her. And she was like, holy shit, who's that? And I talked to her a little bit about Catch the Fair One, and she told me about this character. I didn't realize it was for True Detective at first. Um, she just had this, she just wanted to pick my brain. You know, that whole artist pick your brain thing. And then I got the audition, and 
she, her, I, evidently her, her casting director and Jody were like, nope, she's the one from from the jump. But I had to kind of go through the process. So you, you had to go through the process and at least get other actors think that they've got the role. <laughs> Yeah, no, it was some heated, like, you know, once you start hearing the stories of what they went through, I'm like, it was between who and me and who? What? Oh, my God. It made me want to puke. I was like, oh, my God. She's amazing. <laughs> but... Yeah, so I uh, found you in Catch the Fair one, and um, you played a boxer in that role. Um, but how does it feel to actually explore, you know, other roles and to, to, to get to fully develop your acting chops? I fell in love with this. I didn't realize I, I would. I mean, being an artist at heart anyway, I just fell in love and being able to, I can't say create the character. I me, Like meeting the character and like creating backstories is my favorite thing. Like I literally would sit there for hours, but I'll bounce the ideas off of my husband, Brian, because he's an absolute nutcase, but in such a good way. And just these are the things that not the the audience necessary is not ever going to know but because you know I want to think the thoughts of the character I want to move like she does I want to have reactions like she does or whatever like it's good to have this for my so I I've lived that life up until when we meet her like that's been my favorite thing not just this project other projects I've I've just I'm falling in love with it it's so fun it it's interesting, actually, for you to say that you enjoy that part of the work because for a lot of actors, that's like the least like sexy bit. Do you know what I mean? They just want to get in and do it. <laughs> yeah, no, it's been fun because it's just these little I, these stories. This is what you get to create. I mean, like, don't get me wrong. I love to just get there and do it. But like, it's funny, the more you get, and especially this long of a shoot, like you, I was learning things about the character as we were going along and we did not shoot it in chronological. We set, shot it like a giant movie. So it was like, we got to visit, revisit episode one, like five months in, but I'm like, Oh, I didn't realize this about her. Oh, I didn't realize it. You know what I mean? It's just really cool. And then you get to see like what Jody brought to the table, what John Hawks brought to the table. And we all just sit there and play around and like, yes, I'm like, dude, that's a great idea. Or they'll tell me their backstory. And that's something that's like maybe a secret that maybe I'm the only other character that knows, but I, so I treat them different. Like it's, it's just fun. I don't know. I'm like a big kid with it. Yeah, no, no, definitely. And it's, it's the, the part of acting that you can play with a little bit. And um, obviously the audience doesn't need to know that. It just informs the character, doesn't it? Absolutely. So um, your character is part of an, uh, of the indigenous people of Alaska, as you were saying earlier on. Um, you worked closely with the Alaskan native producers. Um, you know, how did their input uh, shape your understanding of indigenous perspectives and how the relationships impact your portrayal of Navaria? It was everything because, like, I try to tell people all the time, like, this one dimensional perspective everybody has of indigenous people from America or from Canada or from wherever. It's like, you are supposed to look, act, think all the same. That is so far from the truth, it's ridiculous. I mean, there's probably over 600 federally recognized tribes, or tribes not federally recognized, but in the Americas, in just North America. I'm from all the way in Northeast America, and they're all the way in Alaska, so I don't come from them. So it was so, so important for me to say, what do you want to see? How do you want to see yourself portrayed on screen? Tell me stories. Tell me about the food you eat. Tell me a good time, bad time. Tell me about your aunties. And how do you pronounce these things? Even though I, my character doesn't, she needs to know. I want to know what she would hear. Like, what slangs do you guys use? Like, everything. It was really, really um, a blessing because I wanted to do the representation correctly. You know what I mean? I'm an indigenous person portraying another indigenous tribe and nation. I want to make sure because I'd want somebody to, if they were coming to play me, I'd be like, you might want to get the perspective of the people that you're playing, no matter who it is, instead of assuming. So it was a blessing that we had these two producers on. And then also, those Native people, if you know somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody's auntie that does this, like I actually knew somebody that has a cousin who was an Alaskan state trooper, who is a female, who is an Upiak, and who had a lot of those struggles. And it was, I actually met her daughter, which her daughter is like hugely famous, it's ridiculous, but... She came up to me after the premiere. I was like, oh, my God, like, that's my mom. Like, did I have this. That's great. I'm so proud of this. And just to hear that was like, all right, then we did it. I had to make sure at least individually me, I did the right thing. By, I, I can't assume. I don't know. So tell me. And it was it's really refreshing to hear people from Alaska, especially her. It was like, yo, that's just like my mom. It's good. Do you know what? Um, 
I was thinking that some people might think, well, why am I asking that question? Because you are obviously a indigenous person. Why are you asking that question? Because like you said, there is an assumption, isn't there, that everybody's the same. Or the only, I think, not the only, but mostly the representation has been very a narrow view, hasn't it? It has, and even the stories that are being told by Indigenous people has always been a sad, somber past story that was written through the lens of a white person or non-Indigenous person where we don't need people to tell our stories. This is a contemporary story that happens to have an Indigenous person in a, a police, in a law enforcement who is not full, that's another thing, not being um, full Indigenous, not being full Nupiak, she's mixed, just like I am. So it was like, a, so, on so many little boxes, it was awesome to be able to broaden that that view of where Indigenous people are supposed to be in film and art, especially right now, too, booming. I mean, Lily Gladstone just won the Golden Globe. She just got nominated for an Oscar. There's Res Dogs that came out. There's so many. There's Echo. There's so many. Like, right now, to be in the middle of that, I'm like, oh, it's popping. Like, we here. So it's really, it's really amazing time. I'm I'm loving, uh, yeah, all of the representation that is... Uh starting to happen in not just for for you guys uh but also i'm seeing uh, asian a lot of asian uh, actors now as well um so yeah it's uh still somewhere to go but a little bit but we're making one foot in front of the other i was gonna ask you because obviously we both know the uh the importance of representation on screen um you know how do you think that your role in night country contributes to changing perceptions and um, increasing visibility for Indigenous people and women in the entertainment industry? Women, and for sure, because you have these two women in this very male-dominated job. I mean, they're police officers in this very remote place, and there was arguments about, oh, it's such a feminist show. I'm like, because there's two female detectives does not mean it's a feminist thing. There's men are represented, but if you look at the contrast from the first season, it was very misogynistic, male-dominated perspective. Now we have a female perspective, but there's still police officers in this male-dominated world. I think it's a good contrast because as a female, as a woman, we can identify with the victims, with the crimes a little different. You might have a little bit of a different view on it. Um, so I like that about this particular project, but I just think Navarro in a whole, number one, we have this remote place in Alaska that we don't really get to see. We have somebody who's of mixed heritage, mixed race, that doesn't really know what to fit. We have a female trooper that has these, she's not, she didn't go to Yale and she has her things hap, uh, together and she just happens to be not white. She just has, she, she's been through some shit. Um, she's fighting these, these, these personal battles. She's trying to fight justice for this this community that she's a part of, but not really like this. It's all, she's very relatable to a lot of people, to a lot of us. I didn't grow up seeing these types of mixed faces or these mixed stories or these stories that are not one dimensional. So I would like to hope that, you know, somebody walking by one of them billboards that, that, you know, maybe 10 years old that has aspirations of telling stories one day that maybe thought that cause she wasn't white or she wasn't just looked a certain way that now, Oh, she, she I could do what she could do what I could do. Even as far as having pet piercings, having tattoos, even that community hasn't gotten touched. Like, they, this was a, not a character choice. This was something that the director liked for me that we made a part of the character that you don't normally see. You don't normally see tattooed up, eyebrows scarred up, like people in and that can actually be functional in a very high ranking type of job. Like, it doesn't matter what you look like. You still have the, the soul and the brain to do these jobs. I hope even on that aspect and that perspective, I can shed some light on that. I've had people, Pearson people like, I ran by your, your billboard. I'm so happy to see somebody with Pearsons. And I'm like, really? <laughs> so it's kind of cool. Can I ask you a question? Why? Why are you vi vi violating Karvik? Why, why, why are you violating him? Like a, like a drive through <laughs> That is not me. That is Navarro, number one. Um, Navarro has her reasons. If you pay attention to it, that, the, her her relationships with everybody, Kavik included, kind of explain her her what what she what's going on in her head um, and what her certain outlets are, um, if she has any. Uh, and Kavik being one of them, Kavik just wants to love Navarro, and, and Navarro is kind of like. Um, 
how do I explain this? It's like when you have like a, a dog has a or a little kid has a toy, and they're like, "All right, don't touch it," but I'm gonna come to the to you. But no, wait, no, I'm gonna nope. No, but you don't move, but I'm going to, it's like one of those things where she can kind of, he's a safe place for her and he doesn't expect anything from her. He takes her his time with her and he's just like, I'm going to let her do her. And if she comes to talk to me, great. If she doesn't, I'm not going to even press her for it. And she appreciates that space. I think it was a little bit of a hit and run. It was. A hit and run. But you know, you're a busy working woman. Uh, you've got to have your needs met. And I actually, joking aside, I think it was actually a, a, a quite an interesting take because, you know, I think women, or at least people don't think women have those sorts of needs and they have to kind of juggle being a career woman with obviously having her needs met and then she's got all of this other stuff that's going on. Um, so I, th- I, th- I thought actually that was quite an interesting take and uh, the body was looking slammy. I mean, I am an athlete. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> the body was looking slamming. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now, but it was when I um, because that was you know especially so nuanced in my career, personally wise and like career wise, there was a lot of choices I had to make for my own, my own morals. You know what I mean? Um, my own respect for myself, respect, marriage, respect. Um, so that that was juggling. But the way when I first read it, I was like, well, this is flipped on its head because we don't get to see women portrayed sexually in that 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 field we always see kind of the opposite is true uh cons- consent doesn't necessarily mean like it was their choice to do certain things you know what i mean like it's okay you agree eh, but it's like the perspective of how it looks the act of is usually portrayed differently and if you really look at that the navarro doesn't use that as she don't finish she just has it's more or less like a, gaz- uh, a lioness jumping on a gazelle and then that she's done she don't even eat it she just wants to kill it and then she wants to be out y'all eat kind of a thing so it's a, it was a very interesting way she painted it i was appreciative of it and um i'm proud that i was able to personally um have my morals and my needs and my comfortable level to be met because that was weird were you asked, you know, how far or were you just off the jump like this is my this is my level and this I'm not willing to dip my pinky toe further? Pretty much because um, that was something that was like, oh, we're doing. Oh, this is love this character, love this whole story. But that's something that especially being so new and being a, uh, from an outsider, like just a regular person that doesn't know how those things are done. Having an intimacy coach, very thorough. Um, there was immediately what is your comfort level i'm like i know the story that needs to be told and i know where my comfort level is so let's meet in the middle and every every need was met um i was taken uh very seriously uh my boundaries were not crossed whatsoever every boundary that i put up um and tried to work around the story being told was met with grace ease warmth and patience and uh scene partner was an absolute dream to work with very respectful so as awkward as those things are it was actually a good experience never want to do it again but (laughs) i'm glad it came out the way it did it sounds like the intimate scenes were handled really sensitively and um i'm glad you didn't have to derobe fully and that you um so early on in your career have set um, your own boundaries. Yeah, that was a, a that was boundary number one going into this uh, career wise. Like I have certain morals and boundaries that I will not cross, no matter how great the role is, story is. It's just not gonna happen. That I am I am a very happily married woman as well. That we're both navigating through this new found success and these new opportunities. So I will always always protect myself personally, um, and my family with that too. Um, and I and I hope now also there be actresses that listen to this and feel the courage to kind of do the same, you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I mean, I'm sh- I'm I'm sure I've heard horror stories like 20 years ago. I'm sure it was way different, but even 20 years ago, I'd have the same type of. I've always been like this. Um, so this is a very unique situation, especially how I got into this industry. It's like I gotta I gotta ha- I gotta be very fleet plant feeling on the ground very secure within myself and just trust that the things that need to work out will work out no matter what that is I don't want to go okay okay you know what I mean I've you know we've all been there um and then regretted it later so absolutely not that will never get crossed yeah that's great that's absolutely great so um yeah let's talk about you meeting Jody for the first time I heard uh <laughs> I heard you were fangirling a little bit um 
Can you kind of elaborate on how you kind of managed to to keep the balance of excitement uh, with the demands of this project? Boxing has trained me well, man. Don't let the judges see you tired. I'll tell you, I said that on the podcast earlier this week, like legit, like, oh, don't let them know that that was a good shot. You know what I mean? It was a, you know, ring generalship really put into real life. That's what it was. Um, It's funny because going through my movies that I actually like grew up watching and loved, a lot of them are Jodie Foster movies. And I didn't realize that until I'm like, oh my God, I'm going to meet Jodie Foster. Oh my God, I'm working with Jodie Foster. Holy shit. So when she walked through the room, we had our very first table uh, re- rehearsal, and she walked through the room. Mind you, she's like 5'2". She's so little. She's a little bit, but big personality. She, I was just like, when she walked through the door, I'm like, oh, snap. That's like really her, like in the flesh, like, oh, my God, oh, my God. But I had to give her like, oh, so nice to meet you, really calm. And it was cool, but she was so, like, nice, open, warm. Uh, funny so it was one of those things where like I never really the only other fangirl moment I had was when I met Mike Tyson and I was like oh can I take a picture that was I couldn't hold that in (laughs) but uh she was amazing she's a really cool person so it was but it was funny I'm like if anybody can hear my inner dialogue right now it's I'm like oh my god three four two sounds so stupid I guess it is a little bit like a weigh-in isn't it you know that moment when everybody has that poker face Oh, I had a poker face. I mean, I was like, Texas Hold'em when she walked in. I'm like, "Mm mm-hmm. Yeah, how you doing? (laughs) Who are you? Oh, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, I think I've seen some of your work. (laughs) Really? Really, though? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) So um, were you able to sort of pick her brain a little bit? Um, Did she mentor you or did she... uh, you know, give you a few tips, not in a kind of annoying, giving notes to other actors kind of way. Uh, but yeah, were you able to sort of glean tips and tricks and? Yeah, I mean, through the whole, through the whole pro- just even just watching her work, like watching again. I'm gonna use Mike Tyson, like it was like being invited to to work and train alongside Mike Tyson in like '86 in the best camp. Like it was like. Oh my God, this woman has done this since she was three years old to see how she had, even the way she had, like when we had the paper scripts, because after a couple of rewrites, I was all up in my iPad. I'm like, I don't need an iPad. I like old school pages. I'm like, fuck that. But she had like her sticky notes and the way she was moving and, and the question she asked Issa and even her directorial eye was she was bringing things for the story perspective directorially. And then what she brought to uh, the table with Danvers, um... Even I would pick her brain on set, like, what the fuck does MOS mean? Like, again, I'm so new to this. I'd be like, what does that mean? And she would be laughing, like, oh, it means this. But she would give me advice, un- not unsolicited. It would be advice, but not. It, I don't think she realized what she was doing. Like, she, we were just having a conversation about things. And um, just watching her work was all the advice I needed. Like, just seeing when the camera was off. That's what a lot of stuff, I've learned a lot from her. The way she treated the PAs versus talking to Issa was the same. She's so kind, humble, very, very generous with her time and her knowledge. Very supportive. Like she would say time and time again, like, well, Danvers is supporting Navarro's journey through this whole thing. Like this is not Danvers. Like she wanted to make changes to Danvers to support what Navarro was going through. Like she made her a white, racist ass, unwoke, very logical, rational asshole more so because it supported where Navarro needs to go like it really brought Navarro to life too that was a yeah that's an interesting uh take on the character completely um yeah I was about to say something else but that will give the plot away so um I'll 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 not say um yeah so effectively uh i think i i read somewhere or i heard it somewhere that you know uh when jodie foster saw your audition t- tape she was like you know she's she's the one um but let me just read a little bit of text uh, uh this is uh one of the things or some of the things that uh, jodie foster has said about you that you're an amazing actress uh you have a quality she has re- rarely seen that lives within you and uh she, uh, coupled with an an internalized sensibility. That's beautiful. Um, wow. Aw, Jode. <laughs> That's awesome. 
I'm Jodie f***ing Foster. <laughs> I know. That's so insane. Man. She's such a good study of people. Like, I love watching. She'll, she, like, will tell you. She'll analyze and she'll break them down. She's very, very intelligent. So she, she knows me very well. And she, we spend a lot of time together. But that's so sweet that she would say something like that. From her, a legend. What the hell? Yeah. I mean, that's, that, that's yeah. That's a compliment. Uh, yeah. Um, did her commitment uh, influence you uh, or, or, or the, the dynamics of, of behind the set at all? Yeah. I mean, um, her commitment to relaxing helped because like I'm an athlete. I'm perfection, Virgo, over and over again, have to do it, you know. I love to laugh, but I'm when I'm training. It's like this. I, I got to do it, especially like I'm in this new territory. I have a lot to prove. I have no idea what's going on. Like I do, but like this is a huge, huge thing. Um, way out of not out of my element anymore. But I, it's just a big thing to tackle on on such a so being so new. And you know, people are watching and seeing me fail, just like with fights. They want to see if I'm gonna do a shitty job. Or if I'm going to actually, or if they made a mistake by casting me, or if I'm going to do good, whatever. So the biggest thing I learned from her is just, you know, every, just relax. Don't take everything so serious. You have, you have another take. You do, especially in a production like this, like, well, we got time. This is not a, this is a big budget. So we got time. And just, that's what I learned. Like, it's okay to fuck up. It's okay to try this and that didn't work or try that. With Things would change on set, as you know, all the time. But that was the biggest thing. It's like, ah, just relax. Everything's going to work out. That That's what I took. That Her commitment to just going, eh, was like uncanny. I think that's, uh, that's incredible, actually, because uh, any actor will tell you that going on set, you know, uh, and trying to kind of not only just match the energy, especially if you're, you know, you're new to the game or you've only just had, you know, you've got a small part, a small role to come in and try and match that energy as in, you know, you're trying to match an Oscar winning actor, basically two time. Uh, and, and then on top of that, just the, just the, the stress. Um, it, but again, I'm guessing it, it, it's kind of similar to, been under the lights as, as a boxer i've i've said it before like this is new territory but that it's the same grind it's the same mentality type of mentality that so i'm out of quote my territory but it's so familiar to me if that makes sense so it's the same type of thing you don't you know you go into a new gym going to you know going into the uk gym for the first time I'm like all right y'all are different than us but y'all are the damn same you know what i mean or any gym that you go into you don't really know Who's what? What's what? So you, it's the same. It's boxing, and I'm still gonna go in there and spar and bust some heads. But I really don't know what energy. So it's just, it's the same, same, the exact same energy. Yeah. And uh, I guess they're both performance based, boxing and acting. Um, they require to be kind of switched on, to be able to read and respond in the moment. Um, how, how do the skills and the mindset? required in boxing parallel to those needed in acting especially in uh, uh portraying a, a character like Navarro well number one like trust like you have to have trust in your your team your coaches to see the things that you don't see like I can't go I can't question my corner in the little minute that we have to the game plan going into round three or whatever and I'm like well, what are you sure are you sure that you re I can't do that I have to trust I have to trust the director that they're going to direct me in the direction and see what I can't see on the camera in their vision and, and just execute. Also, the ability to take the information that somebody's telling me and apply it to the situation, apply it to the scene or apply it to the round, apply it to the fight. That that in itself, that's something that I, I just kind of knew going into it just immediately. Also, I can't I can't take criticism personally at tough skin. Like, people coming for me, especially, like, that's when, like, you guys got to come a little harder than that. I've been in boxing for over 20 years, like, no. But I can't take anything personally and then be, like, all offended by it. Like, you telling me I got my ass whooped that round. You're doing it to tell me I got my ass whooped that round and I need to keep my hands up because you're getting caught with the right hand. If that takes suck because you're not, you missed the line of this or you're, it's just not matching, I need, I don't want to be, wow, he's an asshole. It's just not going to work for anybody. The goal is to win the fight in boxing. The goal is to get the best out of each performer in, in this performance in the scene and there. So I can't take it personally. The fact that the repetition, 
Repetition, repetition, repetition, repetition. It doesn't matter how many times. Just do it one more time. One more time. And always the one more time, the one last round, the one last mile is always the one that is going to change the game. Like, my last takes at the hour 13 is probably the best takes. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, God, another setup. You know, it's one of those things that, that be able to just keep trust in the process. And the, be, the ability to be present. Like, I can hit the bag for, I don't know, 100,000 hours. I can do the pads. I can do the stupid made with pads. I can do all, all the shit. I can read my lines, read them with a hundred different people. I can read it with Jody. But until that camera goes on, until that bell rings, the bell rings, you got to be in the moment. Because I could practice, but if somebody's not standing right there for my one-two that I worked on for six months, and they move and they do something else, and all I did was that, and I go, well, that's all I'm doing. I have to adjust. I have to be, I have to be able to analyze what's going on and react off of it like that. So the same thing with, with in the scene is like, I can rehearse these lines, but if this actor comes out, guns are blazing, and I got to react off that because we're doing a take where we're trying something new, and I just want to stick to my lines and stick to it. It's just not going to work. So you have to be very, very present. So there's just so many things I found parallel. It's interesting because you're very new to the game, but the fact that you have recognize that because there are um, some actors that my acting coach used to call vacuum flask actors that they don't take into consideration anything that's going on opposite them they know how they've rehearsed it they know what they're gonna say and everybody else do you know what I mean yeah and you can tell those even watching one as a fan as a viewer I can tell the person just practice that line that way 80 times in the mirror and they didn't care what was the other person it's like those are the best like improv i love i freaking love improv i love doing improv because you get real time reactions and you got to come come quick with it so yeah i appreciate i just appreciate that especially as a as a fan of just art and film and stuff so what about uh the the similarities or differences in your mental and physical preparation uh, for these two different professions you know were there any yeah so with boxing I mean it's a job you ha I have to even if I don't you know I want to take a week off in the middle of camp unless I'm sick even with that like you can't because that's your job you physically have to do your job um, but boxing is very mental you can physically do your job but be mentally fucked and that physicality is not going to hold over in round six seven or eight when you're just like mind's not there you can't be present or you can't take the direction or you can't hear anything you can't use your own ring iq it doesn't matter you can be you can have abs washboard abs i've seen people who look out of shape but are mentally there and destroy the person who got all these muscles i've seen it. you can tell the difference mentally um so that is i've i've taken my mental game i kicked it up a notch the last few years in boxing too because i realized that especially being in the elite level when you're a world title holder to target me back people have some some fighters have this expectation of when i get a world title i can chill that's wrong if you're chasing a world title just know this it's not that's not the time to relax that's when the real work starts you have to work twice three times as hard because everybody wants what you got it's not you can relax and just post all these stupid instagram videos of you hitting the bag 15 seconds like you got to do more work the, when the camera's off and when people ain't around that's when the work really matters because you got a target on your back i've always known that and I've, that's always what i wanted put that target on my back i can handle it now with uh film with this i knew the character was very physical i knew my athleticism was going to be a real asset to it but i also didn't want to be one of those actors that you stick a gun in my hand and i don't say no lines but i look tough but i can't say anything you know what I mean? I didn't want to do that because I've seen that happen too. Not saying any names, but I've seen that happen. It's like you have to do, you got to do a little bit more work than hold a gun and, and look mean. Like also with film, I've learned that it's not what you physically say. It's what you tell the audience without saying a word. So like just knowing how, understanding my character and what she thinks and what she does. I've picked up a little experience that I've had, always had like a tick or something that my character does that separates myself from them. So I know that they're doing, this is Navarro, not Kaylee. But I use boxing and working out as my grounding for when I'm acting. Like I'm in, no matter what, I will work out before and or after. If I miss a day, I'll at least sit in the sauna or do something at home. Even if I only got five hours of sleep, I have to do something to ground myself physically in my body back as Kaylee again. So I use that um working out and i i did i i boxed i did boxing training a bit but i i really stepped back from boxing i needed to um physically mentally everything um so while i was while i was shooting 
I was, there was there's actually a good little boxing scene in Iceland. Um, but I was training to ground myself back to myself. Um, and mentally relaxing, resting, again, sitting and doing things that Kaylee would do to separate myself from Navarro, because Navarro is a very deep, deep, dark, layered character. It's interesting because, uh, like I say, your insight into just the, the actor's needs or the needs of an actor in terms of... Um, you, there are a lot of people, I think, that think that actors just learn lines... Uh, you know, have a few rehearsals and go, and that's it. I don't think they recognise the actual, the work, the deep work that goes into it. Have you, um, have you experienced that? Yes, I have. Um, I get, you know, even with boxing, it was like, oh, that's cool. You get to travel the world and go like, oh, you're such a good shape. You look great. And I'm like, do you have any idea how much work this is? <laughs> like, oh, I wish I could just. But also, I'm getting smashed in the head. <laughs> Yes, I'm like, you want to trade jobs? Not really, but like, at this state, oh, oh it's you. I wish I had a body like you. I wish I could be healthy like you. I'm like, everybody got the same 24 hours in a day. Like, I just choose to use mine a little different. So, with this, it's like, oh, that's so dope. You got cast with Jodie Foster. It must be like, you're acting. It must be, oh, you live in Big Willy style now. I'm like, you know how much work this shit is? Like, it's so much work. It's, it's hustle. Like, the men, the, like, what me too, like, my ability, again, to kind of go back to the question to put myself 100%, 110, all the way in with boxing, like, and I don't just, I'm not just saying this, this is a legit, oh, oh thought that's going through my head, especially my last fight. Well, I'm willing to die in here. And I mean that with every fiber of my being, like, I'm willing to die in that ring. Like, I put my all into fighting. And I put my all into everything I do. I don't care if I'm tying my damn shoes. Like, I'm going to be very intentional tying my shoes. Precise. God damn it. Um, so the ability to check all the way in when that bell rings and become who I need to become in that ring and then check all the way out when it... I'm like, you see me. I'm like, chill. Like, mad chill when the bell doesn't ring. Same thing to do with um, with acting is... For people that don't understand, like, oh, oh, when you did this, you know, I'm like, it's not me. It's Navarro. Like, I legit, like would have my own, like my piercings, for instance, like my other piercings, I would take them out specifically at a certain time. So I'd be like, all right, Kaylee, go have a seat. This is Navarro. I have to embody this person, this other person completely. Think like them, talk like them, walk like them, everything. Even my tone of voice is different. Like it's so much work to really understand that so you can be convincing. Like I have to convince you that I'm Navarro, not Kaylee. Like it's weird for my family. Of course, I get it. Everybody who knows me. It's kind of cool and weird at the same time, but I've experienced people, oh, you're, that's so lucky you get to live in Iceland for and do that. I'm like, I ain't got it. I ain't had a day off. <laughs> and it's like 12-hour days, bro, like in the middle of the night, negative 15. Like, that's just hard. It's work. This You need stamina. You need to be healthy, you know, much like a boxer. Do you know what I mean? It's like you go, you rehearse, you learn lines, you go home, you sleep, repeat. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Um, but what I wanted to ask you about, actually, what was it like in in Iceland? Uh, I think you lived, lived there for seven months, did you not? You know, that must have presented some challenges in itself. And, um, you know, how did you uh, cope with the extreme weather? And, you know, how did that influence your, you know, your portrayal of your character, Navarro? The weather... Uh, and the place that we, we we shot in Iceland and it was it's taking place in Alaska. We they um did a lot of research for a lot of months in Alaska to actually understand what they needed to build in Iceland. If, if we could have shot in Alaska, we could have. But the pff, Alaskan people are built so different to be to be able to, to be able to survive in that type of con weather condition is yeah to build it like respect because it gets negative 60 70 there there's like no roads there's, you can only get there by small planes so they were able to take all of that including a lot of the people from alaska and greenland to iceland um because i grew up in new england we have we have some weather you know it gets pretty damn cold so I, luckily i was i was expecting it to be cold and it was awesome for the character because I got to experience how my character would really feel like being in negative 15, negative 20 at two in the morning. You know what I mean? It was it was brutal. But thank God I played a cop that had a lot of layers on it. Um, but it was it was nobody can prepare you for the wind. The wind in Iceland is different. The wind is like it'd be like negative 10 or something. And then the wind comes. You're like, what is this? What is this? God? But uh, it was um, 
it wasn't something I didn't expect. It was just, it was cold. At the end of the shoot, didn't you have a, a new tattoo? Um, seems sort of, yeah, um, a bit of a tribute to uh, to your time on The True Detective. Can you uh, elaborate on some of the choices of the symbols? Um, particularly, I think there's a spiral, is there not? Yeah, so... Um... At the end of it, uh, you know, it was such a long journey. Um, I just wanted to get something, you know, I have a lot of tattoos, but I wanted to get a tattoo uh, to kind of commemorate my time there because I was trying to get a tattoo while I was there, but my time schedule did not permit. But uh, there was a woman that was actually, she's from Greenland. She's Greenland, uh, indigenous from Greenland, but she lives in Iceland. And she was actually one of the members of the community um, in that portrayed in True Detective. And she uh, lives in Iceland now as an artist. I had asked her, hey, do you know anybody that does tattoos around here? I kind of want to get something, um, but I know you're from here, and I've been trying to book. She's like, oh, funny story. You should ask. I just got taught a traditional and UPAC stick and poke tattoos. You want a tattoo? I'm like, sure. She's like, yeah, I'll come over. I'll come over to the house. I'm like, all right, cool. So I chose to do the spiral because the spiral is known in True Detective anyway since the season one. I've been a huge fan of the season one. I watched it way too many times, I'm sure. But the spiral and it just symbolized to me that things are just gonna keep 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 on going. Instead of having things go full circle or never ending, it's just gonna they're gonna keep you start somewhere and you build, you build, you build and build. The never ending. That's kinda what it means to me. And then I just kinda came up with uh, a few other designs uh that were very inuit inspired of the design, um, to some of the it's very simple, uh, but and it was done in the traditional way by somebody that I hadn't experienced with, so it was very special. Sounds it. I, I, I'll have. Uh, I can't wait to see it when, uh, when we finally see each other again. I know it might be sooner rather than later. <laughs> the series addresses some real world injustices. Um, how do you navigate the balance between providing social commentary and ensuring the realism? of the entertainment industry in your portrayal of Navario? Well, just having a real life experience from my perspective as being a mixed indigenous woman and dealing with these issues from afar and having also the experience told to me by others really up close with these families from particular missing and murdered indigenous women, people, two-spirit girls. Um, so just knowing that I have that shared insatiable just drive and like, have to find truth and justice or do what I can my part and whatever that part is whether it's portraying somebody whether it's telling a story whether it's putting him in my w on my boxing shorts or just having a discussion with people in front of people that don't know about it um it's 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 a honor and a privilege to know that I'm capable of doing this type of work it's not easy um it's it's a very it's a very sensitive subject but I am equipped with the the mental strength and the resources and the opportunities too to tell these stories voice my voice my voice for the voiceless and speak about these things and especially when we get to highlight these certain injustices to our women in particular in True Detective for touching on a missing in Nupiak woman that got murdered and you'll find out all the answers later but um it's always important for me uh, to be able to have the opportunity to speak about it or talk about it or have it represented in some way, shape, or form. In my boxing was important. In my everyday life, it's important. And now in, in film, and it's important, especially with Issa. She's Mexican from Mexico City. She highlights missing and murdered women from Mexico City in a lot of her work. So that was something that actually initially she wanted to talk to me on. So it's really important for me to be able to do that. I'll tell you what else I noticed as well. Um... I mean, obviously, I've known you quite a, a while now, and um, you're always very outspoken, and um, you know, you're always highlighting the plights of Indigenous people. I really love your choice of outfits uh, for your press days, and it's it's wonderful to see you uplifting other Indigenous people. Um, was that a conscious decision to collaborate, or did you who came up with that idea? It's kind of a conscious choice. It's funny, my stylist now that um, I, a friend of mine, she's Lakota, um, but she's married to uh, actually a guy that I know um, from the Shinnecock Met Reservation out in New York in the Hamptons. 
And I've known her for quite some time, and she's a fashion designer. And I, she made the very first dress I wore for Crash the Fan One preview, preview, and then she made my wedding dress. And she's just an amazing, just creator, just like she's just so talented. She beads, she does everything, but she has this cool, creative eye, and she's very intentional with everything that she makes. Like I have intent behind almost everything I do, almost. Uh, so I used to joke with her, like, "You're gonna become my stylist one day. Watch, watch." And now she's actually been my stylist. So her knowing my mission. Anyway, and her mission is just kind of was a perfect fit. So she knows me, knows my style. Uh, and then it just, I just let her rip and everything she has is very intentional, especially with the red is very intentional. It's well thought out. It's let's have the red from MMIW. So when people ask about it, like you are now, what does that represent? It represents this. So yeah, no, it's been um, a very organic collaboration and very intentional one. I mean, it's a great collaboration, but also just just from also a basic point of view of educating people, um, but also you're giving her a platform. You're giving her, a, you know, you're kind of saying, you know, come along with, uh, you know, enjoy this journey with me. Absolutely. I, I saw it as an opportunity for her to get more experience. And now she's nonstop styling other native um artists or other native actors like she had to go out way before i did to la for the premiere because a lot of other people had premieres and they knew she was styling me for this interview so she's like i thought it was an amazing opportunity for her to get on a different um in a front of a different audience so although she didn't really intend to be a quote-unquote stylist because she's a fashion designer but kind of going coincides in being able to feature her actual line and her clothes and her creations is amazing i'm like yeah she's dope man look let's come on with me who else does what like if there's a there's a woman now that when i do stuff in new york she's a hairstylist but she's osage and i'm like oh yes definitely didn't even know that like dude there's another there's there's natives and indigenous people in all kinds of different facets of this industry and it's any opportunity i get jewelry anything i'm gonna make sure i do that I think that's a wonderful thing about you, to be honest, you know, just the the, the generous spirit um, and, and that kind of willingness to bring other people. Listen, there are people in, in <laughs> there are people that just get into positions sometimes and they kick the door closed behind them. And I think it's, and especially actors, I think. Uh, um, but it's just, it's really great to see someone say, do you know what? There's enough room on this platform. Hop on. Do you know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. I think it's just kind of has a lot to do with how, everything to do with how I was raised. I mean, I saw, saw my mom do it, saw my family do it. So it wasn't like, oh, I got this. I'm going to hold this. It was like, no, we got it. It's always we. It's like, yo, I win, we win. Like, I'm Wampanoag, Nip Monk, and up from the Northeast Woodland Tribes. If I got it, we got it. Like, let's go. Like, because we've been quiet. We've been suppressed. We've been judged. We've been kicked out of the circles. We've been kicked off the tables, not invited to stuff so long. And that's just not my specific area. It's, you know, anybody who's been marginalized or been oppressed. Like, we've been kicked out of so many rooms already. Like, why am I going to kick my own people out of the room? Like, not. Nah. Yeah, I mean, let's go. You say that, but people still do, unfortunately. I know. I know. It sucks. What did you learn about yourself whilst filming uh, Night Country? I've learned that, you know, my friend Joseph Kubota Vladika, the writer, director of Catch the Fair One, wasn't just blowing smoke up my ass. <laughs> he actually did see something that I had, have that I didn't see, which also tails back to what my husband, Brian Cohen, saw in me a long time ago when he took his chance on me. And I was like, why is he wasting his time with me? Like, I'm not worth the time because I don't have the talent. And I actually know that I'm well worth the time because I do have the talent. And I have the capability to learn when I don't know. And I didn't know how I was gonna get through this. I'm like, yo, this is insanity, but I am. I ha, I, th I thought I had a no quit attitude and a and a I'll figure it out attitude, but holy shit! Like I will figure it out to the ends of the earth. And then I don't. I've learned to ask for help when I need it. I when I need. I've I've learned how to. I've learned that I had shitty boundaries and I need to put boundaries up as far as thinking that I owed everybody something. Like oh yeah, no problem. I'll do it. Even though I don't want to, I'll do it. I learned that I don't owe nobody and I have the right to say no. I have the right to speak up. I have the right to have a different opinion. And um, 
I'm, I'm very capable of, of doing great things. And that's not, I'm not full of myself. That's not an ego trip. That's just belief. I believe in myself. I'm proud of myself. I don't think if you asked me that a couple of years ago, I would have said that. I'm like, I'm like, dude, that's me. I'm like, it's weird, but I'm like, I did this in crazy, crazy and almost looking like impossible task. And just, you know, get by, but it wasn't a split decision. Like I'm UD on the cards right now. And that feels pretty good. And lastly, you know, we have had this conversation, but I, you know, I, I know you've got another role coming up. But do you see yourself going back to boxing or are you going to concentrate on acting at the moment? I mean, obviously, you've got this gig coming up or, you know, where's your head at? So I actually have um, nothing set forward, but I did after I shot True Detective, I shot two more movies. So I have three movies coming out this year, I think, maybe the other one was later so it might be in the film festival circuit this year i'm not sure but i didn't hang him up yet i haven't officially hung him up yet as fighters we don't know how to quit and i want to fight again i will fight again um i have this blessing in front of me uh to have this other career that's flourishing and hitting the ground running so you know just to figure it out how to capitalize on certain things how to move uh correctly and first and foremost my health the reason why i couldn't even do what i wanted to do after my last fight anyway um this this hiatus this break has done some wonders for me i'm still in the same boat as far as health wise but we have a lot more answers and things are going forward so do i want to fight absolutely will i fight again yes who will i fight let's put it this way um I've had some conversations as of recent. I haven't, Brian has, and I don't do subtle. If I'm going to come in, I'm not going to have a six round two number fight, just put it that way. So if, if and when I come back, I'm going to go for broke, just put it that way. So that's what I, that's what I want to do. Like I, you guys will see me back in there again. Um, am I happy with where my boxing career got me what where it got me the goods the bads in between i absolutely love my career um where it ended um two years ago my last fight health wise holy shit um but like legacy wise yo you know what i mean it's great do i have to fight again no do i want to yes is it great to be at okay when you coming back versus you think you should hang it up now because you know what I mean? I'm kind of, cause we know we've seen people overstay their welcome and I've seen people having these conversations about these fighters. Like, yo, I wish you would just retire. I'm not in those conversations at all. I'm in the, okay, when are you coming back? And it's like, wow, that's dope. So I don't, I have people have to remind me, I don't owe boxing shit. Uh, like I've given my, I've given a lot to it and very happily so, but you know, I got to show up different. I got to move different with the, where I'm at now with both careers. And when it makes sense, um, how, when it pans out to be able to balance correctly, uh, time wise, health wise, fighter wise, fight wise, all that stuff. Oh, you'll see me back in there again. I ain't going to be on a little card though. <laughs> it, I was going to say they definitely, you know, you say, you know, you don't own boxing shit, but I think boxing owes you some do you know what I mean? Uh, it owes you a big payday. It owes you a big platform. Um, you know, you, you've put in the work, you've put in the graft. We'll see what happens. What I will say is, like I said, I have one of the best uh, teams in boxing and, and in acting now. So they know it's best. I fully trust them. And they, the, what the biggest refreshing thing is that nobody on my team is like, hey, you know, you shouldn't. And they're like, no, all right. As long as we have, we check all these boxes. Oh, no, no doubt. They all, they all never stopped believing that I'm capable. So let's, let's see what happens. You might as well nick a pound note, as uh, as I say, and then, yeah, and then just retire. Go out, you know, blazing. Here in the UK, you can catch True Detective Night Country on Sky Atlantic or via the Now app. So listen, I really appreciate uh, you coming on and, you know, giving me your time because I know that you are swamped at the minute. Thank you. It's always a pleasure, man. Oh, we got time for the good ones. What do you mean? Brilliant to hear how you've been getting on. Uh, great to hear your story. Um, thanks ever so much for giving us your time.